this right. Call the regular monthly meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Brightwood Community College Board of Education. Meeting number Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Do we pull the board on this? Yep. Okay, Dave, pull the board. Commissioner Rosted? Yes. Commissioner Deutsch? Aye. Commissioner Dawson? Aye. Commissioner Morgan? Aye. Commissioner Griggs? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. That's. I think that's the first time we've had a consent agenda with four items in it. Thank you. Uh, next up, recognition of audience. Do we have anyone in the audience um, signed up to be recognized? Uh, we do have some people visiting today. I guess it would be up to them if they'd like to address the commission. Anybody? <laughs> All right. Next up, director's report. Dave? Uh, the one thing I wanted to comment on uh, as director's report tonight, um, President Griggs is, you know, Commissioner Dawson had asked about where we are with our Yonker Farm Conservancy uh, Park. And I just wanted to let her let everybody know, and I did send out some emails to try to reconvene our, I call it kind of a brainstorming group. And we sent it out to several uh, conservation agencies within the city of Fargo. We've got Audubon, Dakota, River Keepers, uh, North Dakota Game and Fish, Northern Plains Botanical Society, um, NDSU, uh, the Red River Zoo, and we're going to try to reconvene everybody along with Commissioner Morgan who would like to sit on that committee and <clears throat> kind of pull everybody together and see if we can come to a consensus and a collaboration effort to kind of um, redesign that park into a, a conservation park that would, you know, be able to kind of a learning center for kids and adults alike and have an indoor and outdoor component to it. So I uh, just want to let her know we did get going on that this week and uh, we look forward to uh, getting everybody together and kind of brainstorming ideas of what could happen up there. I was at the City of Fargo Resiliency and, and Sustainability meeting here just before this meeting and let them know of kind of what our plans were because uh, one of the topics today was native prairies. So it's going to be a great demonstration site for City of Fargo and the Park District and and uh, a destination site for North Fargo. So we're looking forward to it. Um, and I know we did have a couple uh, other director's reports and we do have uh, Kevin, Carolyn and Dave Beats that I would like, I would, you know, I'd ask them to give a brief report on kind of the areas that uh, have been asked about. And I, I know Kevin's was on uh, Broadway Square. So Kevin, if you could. Certainly, commissioners. So really we've transitioned out of the winter. Uh, the rink is out. We've got turf down there. The new sign is out. Um, so we're currently looking for hiring staff. That's part time. We do have some a one full time position that we'll be looking to fill. Uh, down there we've got a new screen that we have a bid process that will be opening bids tomorrow. Um, part of that bid process is a naming of the pavilion, which will pay for that screen. Um, that will come with the signatures of that of that bid and the naming sponsor. Uh, as far as programming goes down there, we got 68 events and activations planned for April through June. Some of those events are the World Book Night, working with the Fargo Public Library, NDSU Press, um, to have that uh, World Book Night on April 23rd. Um, we have the community sketchbook projects, Chalk Fest on May 1st. We have a national pet activation, which will have a Broadway Square pet pampering station down there. Uh, we'll offer cornhole leagues that'll be going on there. Peggy Lee Day, Spring Makers Market that'll be on May 22nd. 
with 20 different vendors and two to three food trucks that will be down there. Fitness series that'll happen over the noon hour, uh, Monday through Friday, with working with area health clubs that will be provided that uh, fitness studios down there. We'll also have fitness Fridays, movie nights, music uh, at the square, and then we've, we've got some big rentals coming out, the TNT Fitness Gala, and the ABLE games that'll come uh, May, May 13th through the 15th. Obviously, you guys all know about the DC, DCP Street Fair. Uh, they'll have community concerts and going on in that square from July 15th through the 17th. And then the Hatch Coaching uh, Meet and Greet. We will be having a committee meeting, the Recreation Committee meeting on uh, next Friday the 23rd. So Anna will be going through a lot of these programming uh, items in more detail at that time. So that's kind of the summary of what I have for Broadway Square at this point. Any questions you might have? Is the is the screen a video screen or yes, a video is, video board? Yep. For the movies or for other Correct. things? Yep. How big how big is it? Uh, nine by sixteen. Life size. Life size. Mm -hmm. So it will be nice and it'll be retractable so we can, it's not a tear up and, and put up all the time. Okay. So and it, won't, and it won't blow away. So oh, you won't right. need. <laughs> we don't need to Jonah come and hold harness it down. It down. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it'll get put away between events or it's permanent. It's a permanent structure, but it can be lifted out when we have stage stage okay. set up down okay. there. Yep. Got it. It'll retract back into the ceiling. Yep. Got it. That's Thank part you. of the bid process. Do you, um, are you happy with 68 events? Is that kind of where you were thinking you'd be? Yeah, that's a significant uh, number of events in those short months. Obviously, uh, July and August will be a lot more of those events, but yeah, extremely happy with those events. Yep. Um, I'd like to ask, what is it just went on in this last week? It, I see there's a sign there, but then it seems like there's a kind of a little ramp there too. Is that for entertainments? Yeah, that's more of a seating area uh, for people to take pictures in that. That was part of the original design with the Kilborn group. So, yep. See, well, I just was thinking I could see skateboarders. Oh, yeah. There. We just talked about that uh, this week. It's perfect for skateboarders. Yeah. So they'll they'll have to look at adjusting some of those, whether they got something in the top for so they can't roll nice over over the top of that. Yep. That'll make it even more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Are you getting your skateboard over there or not me? <laughs> but I'm willing to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kevin, I got a question. Um, what are some of the lessons learned, things you've learned that uh, you maybe did, anything new you're going to have things that surprise you what what are some of those things that uh, have surprised you or we've had to stop and rethink how we were thinking it was going to work out well i think the the major component mr osted was the the rink um it's a little bit more involved than kind of what we thought weather plays a factor in there uh, with wind blowing that snow around and we were fortunate enough to have very little snow this winter. So I think there's gonna be challenges ahead and kind of uh, heading some of those things off and planning. We just met uh, last week, uh, Anna and I and, and the ops team with Dave and his staff about um, what happened this winter. So I think there's gonna be, you know, the challenges with snow and weather and and planning ahead, working with those different partners, I think are, are critical. Thank you. Yep. Uh, who wants to go next? Uh, Dave Beats, would you like to <clears throat> give a quick update on Lindenwood, please? Sure. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Uh, the Lindenwood Road Projects got started late last week. Uh, basically, what we've done so far is we uh, got our final alignment figured out, which was an exercise we wanted to do last year, but never had the opportunity just because the ground froze and it wasn't conducive to actually getting out there. And we didn't have the contractor on board so we could make those adjustments uh, with the alignment like we wanted to and we knew we would have to once we got the contractor established. So anyway, we did that exercise, went through that. I'm happy to announce that we uh, significantly decreased the number of trees that we took. 
we uh, ended up taking uh, 32 trees that we had to cut down, and we moved five. So of our original number of 82, I know that was a, you know, a point that, that garnered a lot of attention. We, we were considerate with that 82. We knew that from the information we had at the time, 82 was the maximum number of trees that we were going to impact. Uh, so we're grateful that after we were able to do our exercise, we, we greatly reduced that number. Uh, those trees have been removed. The, the five are scheduled to be transplanted yet this week, hopefully if the weather allows. Um, basically what's happened is by the end of this week, we should have all of the asphalt and gravel out of the phase one portion, which is right by the info center the, as you enter into the east side of the park and by the camper's lift station, by the camper's restroom. Um, and then we have construction fence up throughout phase one and phase two is basically where we're at. So, oh, any questions on that project? How many do you plan to plant? In we'll stick with our two to one ratio of planting, but you know, as we talked about throughout, we're always planting trees throughout our system. And uh, Reforest the Red is a project that we partner on with the city of Fargo uh, Forestry, as, long as, as well as some other entities, river keepers and, and other entities in the community. And we're kind of slowly marching towards Lindenwood in the river corridor. Uh, right now we're by the water treatment plant where we've had our last year's project. This year it's scheduled to go just a little bit further south of that. So we'll replant the ones right in Lindenwood at a two to one, the ones that we removed. Mm -hmm. uh, but we addition, you know, we're always replanting and adding more, uh, not only that part, but all of our parts. And just kind of also in line with tree planting, you know, we'll have our annual Arbor Day celebration with the city of Fargo and the Fargo Park District. and. It moves as you move further north, so I'm just not quite sure if that's that second or third weekend of May, but you know, that's an opportunity we get kids out there to help plant trees. And, and you know, I know our forestry department typically plants in that 300 trees, give or take 50 or uh, trees, but as Dave said, that riparian reforestation, those, those are thousands of trees, saplings, and, and granted, they don't have the survivability rate, but you're still uh, introducing more trees in the riparian area, so. Uh, the Arbor Day, Arbor Day planting, um, is that the same day that Moorhead is doing their edible tree planting? Because I think your par uh, Fargo Park District is part of that. And I thought that in an email it said it was Arbor Day. And that very well could be. So, I'm just not sure, but we can check on that for you. Okay. I can tell you that this year our Arbor Day project will be at Longfellow Elementary School and then our park. So we got plans there to, you know, engage with the school kids from Longfellow and other area schools that will come and participate with that as well. I just was recalling when we did the tree planting over at Jefferson, uh, it was such a cold day. And do you remember? I do remember. Yeah, and the mayor was there and he gave a speech and everybody was frozen. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope for better weather than that. And yes. Yep. Yeah. It's really fun though. Fun to see all the kids out there planting and learning the process. Dave, the two playground things that are happening, are they going to go on separately so that one of the playgrounds is always open? Has that been yeah. thought out? Uh, uh, playground improvements uh, that you just did in the consent agenda, the rotary resurfacing will take place in the month of May. So we'll essentially shut down the rotary playground for the month of May. Uh, the main shelter playground will not be touched until August 15th. Okay. We did that perfectly just so we didn't have, you know, zero playgrounds available yep. within the park. Uh, and, and also, you know, as early as we're getting started with construction, I will add this, uh, Kevin and his team have been really great uh, kind of juggling shelter reservations mm -hmm. because we're, we're allowing the contractor to get going in phase two uh, a little bit earlier than what we had anticipated as well as phase one. Phase one wasn't supposed to start until May 1st. There's a good possibility that we could have phase one and two with good weather and those three caveats uh, done by the time phase two was going to start. Uh, so we're, we're really hopeful that we can, you know, get past this week and, and make some good progress so we're not disrupting the park for as long as we would anticipate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can we put some kind of signage on the rotary fence that says, hey, scoot down a little further, there's another playground? Okay. That messaging out so people are aware of when it'll be closed and that we do have another playground available. Because the there's probably a chance that people have been to the Rotary one but haven't 
gotten in further to know there's another one? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I received an inquiry about um, the black top that's in the RV area. Is um, I, I know that you had said you were gonna remove, be removing a lot of black top in the parks district. And um, I'm just wondering if that's part of this Lindenwood project to remove that. It isn't as of this point, uh, you know, as we progress into, uh, you know, further steps of what amenities and, and the final design, if you will, or master plan is what we always talk about. Once we progress into that stage, I think then yes, my goal would definitely be to replace those camper pads with concrete when the time comes. Um, you know, we'll have to see where prices are and things are at that time, but uh, it, you know, it's, it's very well proven that concrete outlasts asphalt and there's way less yearly maintenance that has to go into an asphalt product or into a concrete product, excuse me. I see, so there is a little road that goes through there though, is that? Oh yes, the road itself, that mm -hmm. is not part of this. Right now we're stopping just short, if you know where the, the camper's restroom is, right mm -hmm. above the lower campground. Mm -hmm. We're redoing that kind of asphalt area around there. Um, and that's about the <clears> only <throat> thing that is associated with the campgrounds that's getting replaced with concrete. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Dave. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And just an update, we um, the edible, Gar or the edible forest is May 13th and Arbor Day is May 21st. So, okay. so thank you, Dave. And I forgot to say thank you, Kevin, for your update, but thank you. And moving on to Carolyn for an update on Legends and Rose Creek. Uh, I know everybody is very excited about the opportunity for a new restaurant at Rose Creek Golf Course. Um, at this point, they don't have an opening date for the actual restaurant. They're in the process of training in their staff, and we are meeting with them tomorrow to talk about some of the improvements they want to do yet upstairs. And so that may be something that takes a little bit longer. Um, they want to move a, a wall, put in a kids gaming area and some things uh, need to be painted. Um, but the grill downstairs, they did have open last week on Saturday and um, didn't have it open today. Of course, the snow made a lot of golfing difficult. So they are hoping that by the weekend that they can be open and they're looking at regular hours there, Monday through Friday from 3 to 8 p.m. and then Saturday and Sundays, 11 to 6. They plan to have um, some beverages as well as sandwiches down there for the golfers. But um, as far as seating for the restaurant, that'll take a little longer. Um, the beverage cart they're looking at having open and out on the course April 22nd. And then um, they do have some special events that are starting to book and their first one is April 26th and they have a wedding on April um, 30th and May 1st. So things are looking to shape up here before the end of the month. Thank you, Carolyn. You and that's... I did not play today, no. <laughs> <laughs> Bragging rights. I don't want to. <laughs> Got it. He needs some orange balls. Yeah. So that's all we have for the director's report, unless any commissioners have any questions. Do you have a question? For... All right, thanks. Hey, everybody. Next up, foundation director's report, Brian. Good evening, commissioners. You have to talk real close. You can bring it even out of there and talk. The lights on green. Is the green light on? I just want to make sure the battery's in bed. Oh, sorry. User error. He killed it. Do you want to just? Do you want to just maybe take Don's and stand there in the corner? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, you could move it over to the podium too. There you go. Perfect. Bob Barker. Yeah, I was say you look like. Bob <laughs> How's this? Uh, so good evening, commissioners. Um, so just a quick update on foundation. First of all, the foundation board is meeting on Monday. Uh, so next week, just kind of our regular meeting. Uh, and we, of course, will have an update on sports complex and everything that is happening around that, including any activity that's happened with Sanford uh, in terms of bringing their property into the city of Fargo. Uh, and then a little bit update from Dave uh, talking about action tonight and all the stuff that's been happening in the last few weeks.
from the park district and park board standpoint. And then finally, Craig and I will provide an update on the capital campaign. The mini update on that is we are busily um, asking people for money. Um, and I mean that in a positive way. Uh, we've had some really good meetings and hope to have um, some success stories to share in the not too distant future. Um, the clock's ticking, I guess, is the best way to put it. And we have a $17 million goal in mind and, and we're optimistic. We're optimistic we're gonna get there. Uh, but it takes one meeting at a time. Um, so we have a lot of those lined up in the next few weeks. Uh, we have sent out a list to all of you of the 50 plus different entities, organizations, individuals that we're wanting to meet with. We've set up meetings with probably somewhere in the third of that group. Um, we'll send that list out again. If there are people on there that you happen to have an in with, we'd love to hear it. We'd love to have some help just walking through the door. So we'll send that out um, tomorrow. Uh, also at the foundation meeting, we're going to we're going to start the discussion of developing a strategic plan. So kind of uh, what comes next? You know, the big project, of course, is dominating everybody's uh, vision right now, but we need to have a what happens after we get this one accomplished discussion. So we'll start that on Monday. Have a little bit of discussion on charitable gaming and and, and our efforts at at determining if that's something we want to do to help raise some funds for the Park District Foundation. And then we'll talk about our classic golf tournament that's scheduled for May 19th. You all should have gotten an invitation to that. And whether you're a golfer or not, we're going to have a luncheon before the event. Um, so make plans to attend that, if nothing else. And that's kind of the update on the Park District Foundation. Anybody have any questions on that for me? Uh, Valley Senior Services, a, a sort of status quo. I mean, we're still doing our COVID takeout meals at senior centers. We started conversations with the state epidemiologist on what needs to happen for us to reopen our meal sites. Um, he is particularly concerned with vaccination levels. He's been watching what's happening with the older population. We're at about the 70% level for seniors and he's pretty happy about that number. Um, so we're cautiously thinking about reopening on June 1st for kind of sit down dining. If we do that, when we do that, People would still need to wear masks. We would still have to kind of distance them in the center so they're not all sitting around tables together. Um, so we're going to have to, you know, put our procedures in place to make that happen. Um, but we know that people want to get together. We know that seniors who are vaccinated are feeling safe and they want to see their friends. Um, so we're going to figure out the best way to do that. Um, getting our staff all vaccinated. We're just about there. And then communicating with seniors in such a way that they know what the expectations are when they come in. And so we'll just keep you up to date as we make decisions about that. Do you think that when they do decide that safe, well, if it's if it's some, if it's safe in some counties, but maybe not other, there's been a lot of news in the in the paper this week about um, not every county is equal in their vaccination levels. But would they let you? Would, is it going to have to be statewide, or are they going to let you kind of pick? Uh, this, that's a good question. The state is, is going to let us determine what we want to do, and we've been looking at the numbers from the, all the counties in the region. You know, so Steel Trail, Ransom, Richland, Sargent, and Cass counties. Um, and they're all fairly close. I think, you know, Sargent and Steel maybe are a little bit higher with the vaccination rates for seniors. Um, but the state's leaving it up to the regional administrative entity to make a decision. We're meeting with the state the end of this month just to get any kind of last marching orders, but 
we think what they're looking for is kind of our guidelines, you know, for what we're going to be doing when we open up, you know, in terms of masking and distancing and sanitizing and temperature checks and that kind of stuff. So we'll learn that at the end of the month. We'll put all that together during the month of May, I think, and hit the ground running in June. I have a question. I'm <laughs> um, just wondering how um, your um, satisfaction level with contracting with Concordia for food is going. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think it's going really well. Um, our participation, you know, is up just slightly, probably from when NDSU was doing our, our meals for us, we're up, I'm going to say 10%, our numbers. I think part of that was just natural kind of um, wondering how, how, the, how are these meals going to be. But the numbers have kind of stabilized, you know, at that little bit of a higher level. So I'm going to take that as a positive. Um, we're happy with the way they're doing it. They have a different menu, of course, than NDSU had. NDSU's menu was great, and their food was great. Concordia is a little bit different. And I think for some people, the variety is something they are enjoying. So I'd say it's going great. Thank, Thank you. you for asking. Brian, do you expect when you open the centers that your Meals on Wheels delivery will go down? Are some of those people at home not coming in and picking them up? Or do you think you'll maintain those levels and needs for drivers? You know, um, if that happens, it's going to take a few months. I really expect that st seniors are not going to come storming back to the centers. Well, you might be surprised. It's maybe. Um, but I expect that it's going to be kind of slowly getting used to being out in public and sure. being around other people. Um, maybe in six months, that number will drop off a little bit, but I don't see it happening right away. Sounds good. How is your uh, driver need, <laughs> speaking of? We're always looking for your volunteers, and if you want to help deliver Meals on Wheels, you can call 293-1440. Takes about an hour, right around the noon time, and we have routes in Fargo and West Fargo. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Hey, Brian, Brian, Jerry here. Um, oh. You're talking about uh, getting staff vaccinated, and you know we're talking about it in higher head about vaccination hesitancy and things like that. What are you seeing within your staff? Are they uh, is everybody on the uptake, or some of them not sure, or just percentage wise? What what are you seeing? So we've got about 125 staff members. So far, I'm only aware, aware of one person who has chosen not to get vaccinated. We have one gal who, on the advice of her doctor, is not being uh, vaccinated for or because of her health situation. Uh, but so far, only one person has not gotten vaccinated. Those are really good numbers. Yeah, yeah. Well. We have a lot of older people that work for us, and older people, I think, want to be safe. Yeah. Thank you. 293-1440, Joe. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. <laughs> yep. Any other director updates? I think that completes it. Next step, board to discuss and consider for approval a Garden of Healing proposal. Kevin Bow and Dave Weaker presenters. I will let Kevin Bow do the introductions for our special guests and Perfect. present this one. Thank you, Madam President. Commissioners in your audience tonight, or in your packet, sorry, is a proposal that was discussed at the Facilities Committee meeting a couple weeks ago. With us tonight is Sarah and Arlen Fisher. I will have them, and they got some guests also in the audience as well, so I'll have them uh, go through their proposal at this time. Good evening, commissioners, directors, and audience. Thank you for having us here tonight. Um, as pointed out, my name is Arlen Fisher. This is Sarah Fisher, and uh, this has been a, a journey that started back in 2018 when um, our 22-year-old son uh, passed away in a car accident. Um, at that point in time, at least for me, speaking for myself, it's like, how can you rationalize a 
perfectly healthy 22 year old who just finished college passing away. And what helped us was through organ donation. And uh, the Garden of Healing is our way, our, our thoughts are a way to give back to the community to help not only us heal, but the community heal, especially through the year we all have gone through. So with that said, if you don't mind going to the next slide. So as we were looking at the, um, you know, how to roll this out. And by the way, I, I'm going to admit, first of all, this is not my area of expertise. I don't believe it's Sarah's area of expertise. So uh, when we got into this, we really didn't know what we we're getting into. So we're, uh, Sarah learned about a Garden of Hope in Wadena, which was sponsored through the hospital, the medical center there. And so Sarah works for Sanford. So at first we started thinking Sanford, you know, partnership with them. Then we thought, well, no, it's more than Sanford. This is the community. So then we started looking around at the Fargo uh, Park District. And I went out to your website and started looking at your mission and, and uh, our, the purpose and so on. And interestingly enough, it was very similar to our organization, which is called Crosses for Cameron. And it's like, wow, this seems like it's uh, a good fit. It's like a glove, you know, it just fits on the hand perfectly. So anyway, that's when we started down the road further. So if you mind advance the next slide. So I'll roll this over to Sarah. Yeah, so I wanted to see what other communities had. Uh, like Arla said, last Friday we wa drove to Wadena and we were part of their annual uh, ceremony. So every April they raise the Donate Life flag and then anybody who has bought a brick for that year, they save it up and then they do the ceremony. And um, the Garden of Healing in Minneapolis, Minnesota is actually by Life Source. It's a great big wall and Cameron's name is on that as well. And people from all over the state come and as you can see, they etch their person's name that they love. So it's just exciting to me that even this would bring so many people to the Fargo-Moorhead area where they spend money, they eat lunch, come visit and then leave. Um, we did the same thing in Wadena, Minnesota last Friday. So. Um, there's another slide. Um, this is another one that's actually in Ireland and Cameron's, we have a rock campaign that I gave each of you a rock and during COVID it became very hard for us to speak to, we go to all the schools, we go to Lions Clubs, we go to different organizations and talk about organ donation and so we started doing this rock campaign and his last rock was just found in Portugal. So it was exciting for me to see that there's other um, countries that do these gardens of healing and hope. Iowa, I found this one. It's very special to me because Cameron's heart recipient is in Iowa. He's a 30 year old man from Iowa who just got married this December. And um, his kidney recipient is also from Iowa. And as you can see, they have paver bricks, they have benches, they have sculptures, they have all different things that provide just a really neat garden and um, people come from all over again to see it. So, so these examples that we have on here are just examples. Again, we're just trying to brainstorm of what would work, what couldn't work and so on. So you can go through the rest of them. This is where we were last Friday. And so this is, we're from Horace, North Dakota actually and um, this is a tree that's in front of Cameron School and the principal, Mrs. Zent, has been very um, gracious to let us put things out there. Um, she actually takes the kids out there and they all learn about what organ donation is and that Cameron went to this school for uh, kindergarten to fifth grade and um, they do projects at the school there and so this has just been a really fun way to uh, commemorate Cameron, but also bring awareness. But as you can see, it's a small area. So we decided we need something bigger than the Horace Elementary School. Um, it creates new rituals for our family because we go there. I just got an email yesterday from Cameron's classmate who has since moved away because he graduated from West Fargo in 2014. But when she made the trip back to see her parents for Easter, she made a special trip see chemistry. Um, as Arlen said, I work for Sanford and I'm on the donor council there as well. 
And uh, these are life source representatives, as well as many of my colleagues. And we got together and we paint rocks. And um, so they are very excited about this project as well. Um, we know that Fargo requires a lot of green space, and that is great for our community. Uh, we just would like to enhance the green spaces that you guys already provide. Uh, April is Organ Donation Month, and it's also Garden um, Awareness Month. So I thought that was pretty cool that the two of them went together. So all those all those features that Sarah talked about, all those benefits, are things that we feel that the the community can benefit from of growing their relationships and finding a place to heal and so on. So as we dug into this, uh, we did reach out to Precision Landscaping. We also re reached out to Dakota Monument to see what what can really be done. And then we also thought about from a community perspective, where would be a great location? And as we had multiple meetings with the park district, we learned a lot of a lot of things about parks I had never knew. <laughs> and uh, we, we learned that this had to be a larger park that allowed for, allowed for parking. So we started looking and thinking, well, what would be a great park kind of in between Sanford and Essentia? And uh, the Urban Plain Park came up. So Precision Concrete went out there, walked the grounds, and they, they circled an area out there, you know, which they, they thought of. And since then, there's better areas we can have. But um, anyway, you know, again, this is all brainstorm. We're looking to, if this gets approved, we're heavily relying on Fargo Park District to provide us guidance on how to build an exceptional area that's easy to maintain and so on. But anyway, so uh, Urban Plains is kind of one of the areas that we liked. Now the bottom part is the mayor, so maybe you can introduce oh. your guests. So on the the on previous the slide, yeah, okay. Right. So w with us uh, as we move, we brought Shannon and Mel. Uh, Mel <coughs> Mel's with uh, Gates uh, Dakota. Dakota Lions, and Shannon's with Fargo Heart and Lungs. Heart and lungs. and uh, Shannon, you actually are a recipient, correct? Yes. Um, um, April twenty second will be actually my two year anniversary to a double lung transplant. And um, it was because of a young man uh, named Zachary Mendoza Rodriguez in Wichita, Kansas, um, telling his parents just weeks beforehand that he had marked an organ donor on his uh, driver's license and that he wished to do that, that, that I was able to get this life-saving uh, transplant. Um, I was back in the lab at, I work at Minnesota State Community and Technical College. I was back in the lab with my 60 students, four months to the day after the transplant um this park would be uh, um, would be huge for me uh you know it would be a place that i could honor my donor um it would be a place that you know, we could visit my my wife and daughter over there um are there and uh, you know due to the due to this life-saving uh transplant uh, i'm able to play with my daughter jump on the trampoline run around go hiking um, do all of those things that I haven't been able to do in a very long time. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I just, yeah. So, thank you. And in conversation with Shannon and Mel, uh, you know, part of it too we're looking at, we don't want to dump this on Fargo Park and say now maintain it. So we're looking at resources of who can maintain it. Well, there's Crosses for Cameron, which is an organization we run. Uh, Gateway Lions volunteered to jump in and help maintain it. Shannon's group volunteered to help maintain it. So we're, we're lining up resources. Also, um, Horse Lions have jumped in as well. So we, we, we're getting a lot of support to help maintain. Yeah, I'm Mel Olson and I'm a Fargo Lion and I'm also the uh, president of, of the board of directors for the Dakota Lion Sight and Health. Dakota Lion Sight and Health is a, uh, um, let's see how I, I want to put it here, but what, they, they, um, um, there, was, there used to be a, a things that called the Lion's Eye Bank and uh, the Lion's Eye Bank, uh, you, you know, uh, got ocular uh, uh, material and uh, sent it on to people that needed it. And that that iBank now has uh, joined with South Dakota Lions iBank to form the Dakota Lions iBank. And the Dakota Lions iBank is one of the leading iBanks in, in all of the United States and uh, come up with new ways of uh, packaging uh, 
uh, ocular material and so forth uh, that that people follow. So, you know, we're we're really uh, we're excited about this, um, and uh, uh, I've heard their presentation before, and and um, I'll tell you what the uh, the Fargo Lions and uh, Lions in general and the Dakota Lions Sight and Health, uh, we support this. This is this would be a, a great project, and. Um, you know, I, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Lions Eye Bank uh, or the Dakota Lions Sight and Health. Uh, first of all, I want to start out by telling you that April, April is the um, National Donate Life Month. So uh, I assume there's nobody here that doesn't have donor on their license, right? And if, if there happens to be anybody who, uh, who hasn't gotten around to putting donor on their license yet, uh, you know, why not? You're, you know, the, the uh, uh, there's, well, you heard the gentleman here who uh, uh, got lungs, was it? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I could tell you a lot of stories. I've been uh, on that board for a long time, and uh, they have meetings where they bring together the donor families and the recipient families, and uh, what a touching operation. It's unbelievable. The people that uh, are enjoying a, an unbelievable life now they can see again or uh, or whatever because somebody had signed up to be a donor and um, and unfortunately didn't need a whatever anymore or whatever part that was and uh, so so I'm you know I'm I, I'm here to uh, really support this project and uh, like Sarah told me hey it'd be a good time for you to promote a Dakota Lions site and health and so I'm promoting it and I'm telling you that April is the month that you need to sign up for and there is really no reason in the world why a person wouldn't be a donor you know look look at what we you can do for people I gotta tell you about one uh, I was uh, each year we have an uh, honor event where where the recipients are invited and, and the donor families are invited. And the first one I ever went to, um, you know, I'm a tough Norwegian and I don't cry easily, but uh, you know, it was unbelievable. This, uh, the, the donor had donated the heart, the donor's family. And the recipient, you know, was uh, talking about how, how great it was and how she felt. And so the lady, uh, the, the mother of the donor came up and said, can I listen to, I think his name was Orville, Orville's heartbeat. And, and so she put her ear there and listened to the heartbeat. Uh, it's, a, it's an unbelievable thing. It's, uh, you know, we, we thank families that, that are willing to do that, to make a, good, uh, a relatively good thing out of a really bad thing, you know, and, and how can you beat that? Thank you. So one of the hopes that would be like the experience Mel was talking about is provide a place where families can get together. Sarah and I drove all over Iowa, Illinois to meet the recipients of Cameron's major or organs. And what a moving experience. Uh, it's telling uh, 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 Stacy earlier that, um, you know, you think of it as one person, but when you go and meet these people, the last, the, the liver recipient that we met, 30 of their family members were there. And so you look at it like this is just not impacting one person. This is impacting a whole bunch of people. Excuse me, I should have said that. Uh, as many as 400, uh, 450 people um, benefit from one donor. Anyway, if you'd like to move to the next slide, please. So coming up next are just some examples when we talked to Dakota Monuments, some different examples that came up. Again, we're, we're not stuck on a certain design. We're just stuck on something that would work for the community. And the, you know, we, we didn't want to come in blind and just say, hey, this is our idea and really have no, uh, no hammer behind the idea. And so we're, we came up with some more ideas as well as costs and so on. So move to the next slide. So funding, you know, that's always a good question. It's like, who's going to fund this? How it's going to be funded? So we looked at different me mechanisms, and one would be by selling a brick. And as we walked into the depot uh, th tonight, we noticed that there are a bunch of bricks on the ground, and I don't know if, how they were purchased or if they were purchased or whatever. But anyway, that would be the concept that we're looking at is someone could uh, – uh, buy a brick in honor, in memory of their loved one, or in honor if it's a if someone a recipient, they could also buy one as well. Um, another thing that uh, we talked about is, uh, as Sarah mentioned, and she passed out rocks. Uh, 
we started this rock campaign because of COVID because we tried to come up with creative ways of getting out the message about organ donation. So we uh, decided that, well, it'd be great to maybe uh, organize a motorcycle run coming up this August. And uh, also Sarah, myself, her parents and many others have helped us paint rocks and I'm so tired of seeing rocks on our kitchen table. I thought, well, maybe before the cycle ride, we could actually have a rock painting event and then, you know, let's say at noon or 1230 cycle or kickstands up and they take off. So then the idea come in, well, maybe we should call the event Cameron Rocks and now we roll. And uh, so we're, we're in the early stages of this, but coming this August, we'll be having that event coming up to help fundraise. And then, uh, you know, we're, we're a 501c through Dakota Medical Foundation. So we're also part of Giving Hearts. So that's another uh, mechanism. And then, and I don't know why this didn't dawn on me at first, uh, but when we went to Wadena last week, all of a sudden I realized corporate donors. I mean, so we're going to start reaching out to corporate donors to also help fund this as well. So those are our major funding mechanisms. And then the last is just the appendix to show you that we actually got some cost estimates. And again, we're not necessarily stuck on these vendors. If there's better vendors that work with the Fargo Park District, we're happy to work with them as well. So at this point, I guess open up to questions. Commissioners, too, that we, Dave and I, and, and Dave Beats from the operations team did talk about a location out there. Um, we're kind of looking more of that a uh, little bit north of 32nd Avenue. There's a nice little open area down there that's got connectivity with the trails and the sidewalks through there. Uh, yeah, so it's a little bit further further south than what this is, where the the uh, circle up there is it's a little bit more uh, high traffic with all the bike rentals and that. So we we thought uh, as we looked at this site that a little bit north of uh, 32nd would be ideal. Is that the area circled in red, Kevin? No, no, that is uh, right next to the main shelter there. So okay. this is, uh, it would be further south on this one. Yeah, if, yeah. if you divide urban plains into two parts, you can see the kind of bisecting avenue there on the south side. So this would be on the further south part of the park with the three large shelters, and then it'd be further south towards 32nd Avenue, as Kevin said, and, and we'd work with, uh, the fishers in their group and you know lay out the site make sure everybody's comfortable with it and then depending on what they decide for you know features and pavers and and uh, we think it would fit down there with you know potentially room to grow grow some so we, we like to do it in a phased approach start it out you know start out small baby steps learn from it and then if it's successful we would definitely like area to be able to expand as uh, you know the concept grows and one question that someone had is, well, what if, what if a large group wants to come and, you know, purchase a whole bunch of bricks? Well, Dakota Monument provided some other options like a bird bath, a granite bird bath, which would be really pretty. And then on the pedestal, there's room for lots of names on that pedestal. And because, you know, we want it to be a, um, a garden looking place. We don't want it to be a, necessarily a memorial. Um, so we looked at at things. There's benches. Um, they could purchase trees, and then that person could um, purchase a placard that goes down below the tree. Um, different shrubs and things. So you know, we we wanted to look like Lindenwood, where they have at the grand entrance there. But also, there's lots of different organizations that have annual things, and and this would be a place where people could host things like that because we do have all the different playgrounds and the, the gazebos with the you know picnic areas and stuff so it'd be a great place to host different events as well I'd just like to say that uh, in consideration of the plan I think it's essential that you have enough space um, and looking at this last one that said it was similar to what is in Island Park I think that's too small so I don't know how you feel about that, but have you determined the amount of space that will be available? No, I think what we would do is, as Dave mentioned, we would take Sarah and Arlen out there and kind of walk through there along with uh, Dave and his team with uh, 
uh, Tyler, that's a landscape architect on staff, uh, and kind of work through that process. So there, there is a significant amount of green space that uh, is in this area that's just north of 32nd. And if you look at some of the examples they have shown, it would <clears throat> definitely fit within that area with some room to expand. So, yep. Well, I'm always interested in design, so of course my favorite is the Irish. <laughs> it's wonderful. Well, so how many bricks are you going to buy, Don? <laughs> These are stones. You don't need a whole lot of well, bricks. Well, there you go. Yeah, see, it's gravel, actually. I, I love the idea of urban planes. I think that makes a lot of sense, like you guys said, between the two. Um, I like that there's a lot of grass area. I like that there's shelters if you wanted to. I mean, it really has a lot of features if you a lot of people want to show up or if just one person wants to sit and be by themselves. So I like that and I like the proximity for you. Plus I like that you're not really penned in of, well, if we go too far, we're now in the outfield of this baseball diamond or a soccer field or you're not really encroaching on anything that we'd have to worry about space. So I like that plus the automatic parking that's already there. But I love your idea and I love your ambition and my heart just breaks for you. Um, but I love that you're doing what you can to honor your son and give back to the community and help others as well. So I appreciate that. Thank you. It's a great legacy and I, I like that you've put so much intentional planning into this and it isn't just uh, throwing it together, but you've really put time and research into it to make it meaningful. Yeah. Well, we want it to look nice. I don't know if you guys are aware, but um, well, the summer that Cameron died, um, we actually had all the doctors for the ones that were um, doing the certification, but Sanford is the only level one trauma center in the state of North Dakota. And we get so many people from all over the state of North Dakota that are flowing in here. And Essentia does too. Um, but we are the only one level trauma center and so these i work there and these families are in all the hotels that are around sanford we read sanford for four days uh, two days before cameron's brain herniated and then two days for them to match his recipients but some of the families are there for months and i just see them congregating to this park you know, buying stuff from Hornbuckers and having lunches there. And, and they have family from all over that comes and says goodbye. So I just think it's cool that it's close to Sanford, but yet we want to be inclusive to Essentia and, and really the community itself. And speaking of donors, just today I was talking to someone and it may be a dumb idea, but started thinking, you know, how you like different groups have like bronze, silver, gold donor levels. Ours would be like pebble, river rock, boulder. <laughs> <laughs> so. okay. Any questions Very good. for the Fishers? Thank you for being here and for Shannon being here and oh. Mel. I was going to say Al, and I thought, no, it's not right. <laughs> really appreciate all of your information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All Do right. need to move on this? So do we have a motion to approve this park? So moved. Second. Second. Do we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Get an echo there. Jerry. Any discussion? Dave, pull the board. Commissioner Rosted? Yes. Commissioner Deutsch? Commissioner Dawson? Aye. Commissioner Morgan? Aye. Commissioner Griggs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. And thank you, Kevin. I know that the staff has been working hard at paving the way for this to come together. So I really appreciate your help on that. All right. Back to trees. <laughs> Up to tree foil. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, this agenda item is to discuss the City of Fargo flood mitigation plan uh, as it relates to Trefoil Park. So you may remember uh, in July of last year, the city came to us with their plans uh, for some flood mitigation that's going to you know, be adjacent to and impact some of our parks. So we heard one last month. Now this month, they're ready to come to us with a formal proposal. Uh, this is with Trefoil Park. Um, on the line, we should have Nathan Borboom and Sean Bollinger from the City of Fargo. 
as well as Mike Love from Houston Engineering. So I'll uh, uh, turn it over to them in just a minute. Within your packets, there's an overall project map of what the city is proposing. Uh, there's also an offer for the easement acquisitions uh, for both a permanent and temporary easement to construct this levy. And then also appraisal for the uh, amount of land that the levy will uh, take up. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Nathan Borboom. All right, thank you, Dave. Uh, good introduction here for uh, the park. Uh, appreciate it. So this is another project that the city is looking to construct this summer, uh, similar to the one that we spoke with you last month on. This is another project that is necessary to ensure that when the FM diversion is completed, that we can safely pass those 100 year flows through the city without being required to construct any emergency measures. So uh, the, on your screen here, you can see uh, the green area is the area that we're proposing to construct a levy behind those uh, five properties along there in Elm Circle. Uh, part of the project or the portions of the project that in part impact your facility is uh, mainly the access road that goes into Trefoil Park. So yeah, so the hand is going right now is basically where the access road goes today. So basically where you see all the numbers listed, uh, so 500, 600, 700, 800, and so on, is where the access road exists today. Uh, in order for us to be able to construct a levy behind those homes, uh, we do have to relocate your access road. That is the hatched area, yep, correct there, that uh, we are moving to the north, uh, which allows us to construct a levy in those backyards and on your properties so that we don't have to acquire any homes in this area and remove them. Uh, this this location uh, has been uh, looked at quite extensively. We tried to bring it as close as homes as we could, but we also know that we have to maintain the backyards as much as possible in those uh, properties as well. Uh, throughout the project, there will be a period of time when access to the park will be uh, limited. Uh, the access road will not be available to the general public. Uh, the trail that goes around the oxbow of the river will remain open throughout the entire duration of the project, but there will be a portion this summer that uh, approximately about 45 days where the access road will be closed and uh, vehicles will not be able to drive into the park. Uh, we've worked closely with uh, the model airplane club that utilizes the park for various events in the summer and we are making sure that we'll have that access road open when their main event in the summer occurs in August. So uh, we will be requiring the contractor to have the road open by that time. Uh, with that, I can open it up for any questions. Nathan, this is Vicki. Um, we, I asked you at the facilities meeting, but of course I can't remember that far long ago. What's the difference between the gray and the green? Sure, so the the green is where the levee will be positioned itself and the orange, reddish, pinkish color is areas where we'll be completing some grading. So that'll be just some land disturbance areas. Makes sense. So all of it will be grass. It'll be that a grass dike. Yep, that's correct. So okay. it will be uh, a levee that's grass. Uh, the dark black line that you see uh, on the home side of the levee is actually a small retaining wall. So there'll be a three foot retaining wall that we'll have back there, which helps reduce the footprint of the levee and help maintain some of the backyards that these properties have today. Okay, so their property line will end at that darker line where the green starts. Uh, not in all cases, no. Um, okay. The ones to the west, that will be the case, uh, but the ones kind of out on the point, uh, those ones will be in their property. Their property line will still go all the way back. You can see that light uh, line off kind of closer to the access road back there. That will still remain their property and they'll still be required to 
maintain that degree of health. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I'd just like to ask if there's been any feedback from the um, 300 feet surrounding. Uh, we've worked closely with the affected property owners here the past year, I suppose. We did have a neighborhood meeting initially when we kicked off the project, which was probably about a year ago at this point. Um, so the, the neighborhood is aware of the project, but over the past six months or so, we've really been working closely with the affected property owners. Thank you. Any other questions? I know we've also got uh, Paul Kegel in the audience, and so Paul is with the FM Skylarks. Uh, so he's been with that group for a long time. We've worked really close with Paul over the, the years. So I don't know, Paul, if you have anything you want to add to the discussion? Well, the only thing that I was concerned about is where the temp new roadway was going to hook up with the old roadway again as it uh, gets down uh, beyond the separation, I'll call it right now, uh, as far as where it'll actually hook back into the former parking area. Did you hear that, Nathan? Uh, no, unfortunately, I did not. Could you repeat it, please? The, the question basically was with the uh, the new portion of the road, you know, there, Paul's curious as to how that connects back into uh, where the parking area would be for the old uh, road, if I'm understanding that correctly. Yeah, I, I can take that, Nathan. So, okay. so where the where the kind of parking area is, you can kind of see it right at the end of where the the hatching is for our new road. And that's that's where that area kind of flares out and there's parking stalls there. We're tying in at that same location. So I don't I don't anticipate any loss of actual parking stalls there. Obviously the road shifts over and where you come into that area is a little bit different, but we're we tried to maintain all that kind of diagonal parking over by the circles themselves. And so that there will be a temporary closure, but the long term is that they'll have the same parking area they had before. That is correct, yes. Yep. And Nathan, I know you mentioned in facilities that you thought the closure would be, um, I believe it was June 1st through July 16th. Is that still the about the 45 day period that we're looking at? Yep, yep that is correct. And at that point, uh, we are, would allow the contractor to open the road up with just a gravel surface. And in the future, we'd allow them to close it for another day or so to pave it. Um, we don't know if the contractor will take that option or not, but it's just, just a way that allowed us to make sure that we get this access back to the park open as soon as possible. Yeah, we, we allow them to close uh, close it for a, a three day period only to do the paving. And we also state that that can't happen over the weekend because we know a lot, a lot of the practices and stuff happen on the weekend. So those were the restrictions that we put in the contract. Okay, any other questions? Do we have a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Sorry. We have a motion and a second. Is there a discussion? Paul, do you have other concerns? Do you have any other concerns, Paul? No, other than I guess you can put this one in there, but uh, they're going to have a temporary vote when uh, they start doing the construction. Yeah, Nathan said that, you know, outside of that 45 day closure period, there will be a road in and out of there. So outside of that time time frame, there, there will still be access, except for the, the contractor has an option for a three day closure when they go to repave everything. And that's kind of one of their last steps. So while we're doing construction, they'll be able to get in. 
Correct, except for that time frame that of when three-day window. Or, yeah. Okay. That forty-five days that Nathan spoke about. So forty-five days, will they won't have access? Correct. They'll have to walk in farther than they do. Correct. Okay. Yep. June one through July sixteenth, no yep. access. Correct. Other than foot. Yep. Okay. So, in effect, it will be closed for forty-five days. Is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. To vehicular traffic. Correct. Yep. Sure. Yep. I apologize for the inconvenience. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, and we run into this with a lot of projects is, you know, summertime is when our, our parks are the, you know, could be argued are the most active times and that's when we have to do our, our construction projects. So we know it's a inconvenience and, and, you know, we try our best to mitigate that. All right, any discussion? Dave, pull the board. Commissioner Rosted. Yes. Commissioner Deutsch. Aye. Commissioner Dawson. Aye. Commissioner Morgan. Aye. Commissioner Griggs. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. So next up are board to consider for approval of the award for the basketball courts at Centennial. All right. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, commissioners, in your packet on this one is uh, an expansion of two basketball courts that we'd like to do at Centennial Park. Uh, this was heard at the uh, March facility meeting and was recommended to bring it to the board for uh, consideration for approval. We did uh, advertise and accepted three bids and had a public bid opening on this project. Uh, what staff is recommending is that we would accept the low bid is from AJ Concrete in the amount of $110,000. Uh, money for this project is coming out of our annual concrete and asphalt budget. Um, so I'd be happy to entertain any questions you may have. Rationale for why we're expanding at Centennial to four courts and two now? Two courts at Centennial? Well, the rationale for why we're expanding at Centennial. Sure. Uh, we've had some issues, it's no secret, in some of our neighborhood parks, and one of those is in the Stonebridge neighborhood, which is just to the north of this. Basketball is very popular there, uh, and, and so we've, with the popularity of that, we've had a lot of congestion issues uh, due to traffic, because people are driving to that basketball court, and why that one over some others we've had, you know, in the past experience of that in other neighborhood parks as well. But Stonebridge is a neighborhood park. It does not have parking. It is not conducive for people to travel to it as a destination per se. You know, it's it's basically there for the neighborhood to walk or, or residents that are close there. Not that we are limiting access by any means, but the popularity of basketball at that particular park uh, definitely is causing a congestion issue in that neighborhood. Um, so as we started to kind of look through that, and I think we all remember last year, we had some you know input from the community as to that that problem. Uh, we started to look in the general area of where do we have a community park, which typically includes parking lots, that we could accommodate something like this. And so we came upon Centennial. Uh, we started talking with the school district. They were in favor of adding this there. Uh, we felt it was a good kind of solution, possibly, to some of the issues we're experiencing at Stonebridge, the, the parking congestion in, in specifics. Uh, so that's really why we, we targeted this location. So are we removing the baskets at, at Stonebridge or we're just encouraging people to go to the new courts or? Our plan is once these are up and going, then we are going to start turning our neighborhood uh, parks where we have full court basketball sure. into two half courts. And so realistically, I think that's just uh, part of the growing pains, if, if you will, that we're learning. Um, we know people like the full courts, but we want to kind of steer them towards our community parks and regional parks where we have adequate parking. Uh, so our plan is, well, once we have it in this area, yes, at Stonebridge, our plan would be to remove the basketball standards on each end of the court that's there now, place them in the middle opposing one another and have one at regulation height for, you know, tween tweeners, I'll call them, teenage kids and adults. Uh, and then one at a lower height, let's say like eight feet for the younger kids to still participate in practice. So that's that's kind of the, the plan we're going with. Um, you know, and we're just starting in this area just because we have the opportunity to do the courts here. You know, we've got a lot of basketball courts throughout the community, but that's what our strategy is internally is to kind of mitigate 
this from happening anywhere else, you know, to get away from some of these parking congestions. And that fits better to the neighborhood park feel of of the, the playgrounds that are in there to begin with. So that makes sense. Like you said, the growing pains of figuring these things out as, as you go along. But yeah, that, that's a great idea and it makes total sense. Logistically, it's a, a good location too because it hopefully will shift that population to courts that are easier for them. Should be more fun for them. Yep, certainly. And we'll work with our police partners because they have been responding to the complaints in the neighborhood just like we have. And so we'll hopefully that that's an opportunity we'll give for the users that are there now to still have that outlet and still do their recreation the way they want, still have parking so we keep everybody as safe as we can and actually now add two courts as opposed to just one. Mm -hmm. What's the expected completion time? You know, then we are hopeful that we would have it done by midsummer, but that'll depend on the contractor's availability. Once we initiate a contract, if we if you folks approve it tonight, then we'll we'll get that nailed down. And there won't be any lights on these? No lights on these. Okay, no. and it's inside the fence. Yep. It's already there. Partially. We will put up uh, an additional fence on two sides of it, the west side and the south side, just so balls don't, okay. you know, travel too far from the courts. But right now there's a perimeter fence around that grassy area. So Correct. you won't just walk off the street onto the court. Correct. Yep. We will have a, a an access to the north, the 40th Avenue. There's a sidewalk on the south side of 40th Avenue. And then we'll also have an access to the east, which is over towards where the parking area will be. Yep. And then they'll ad have to adhere to typical parks close at dark rules. So if someone decides they want to turn on their headlights, technically they'd be in violation and could be suggested to go home. Correct. Yep, same rules will apply even though this is a community park yeah. uh, in, in title. So yeah, same same park rules and ordinances would apply. Okay, thank you. Yep. I have a question and a comment. First of all, I'm not in opposition to this, so would be vote in to approve, but <clears throat> there were some other concerns I re remember from last summer where Johnson Park and was it Stonebridge that had large groups of people coming in, some of them even from other communities and there were more issues than parking. It was other problems. And so there had been some consideration to purchase another property where some of that with larger space and not in a neighborhood per se mm -hmm. uh, would kind of shift some of the problems or maybe eliminate the problems. Is that still under consideration? It is, and that's part of our, our long range capital plan. We still do have plans to locate something like that. It gets difficult uh, just from a land perspective when we get to the inner part of the city as we're starting to develop further south and west. You know, I think we've learned a lot of things, and, and so we're able to kind of program those in in those areas. But yes, a, a quick answer is we are still pursuing that and still looking for that opportunity. Thank you. I remember the tour that we went on. And yeah. It was the property that's south of the, the uh, jail. And I understand that the southern part of that property has been purchased recently. And I don't know if going through with that was uh, that um, um, elderly or some subsidized housing for the elderly. Correct. Um, is that the case? That's correct. And and we did uh, look into the rest of that tract of land and it's still for sale. It's just the price tag is is up there quite a bit uh, from what we initially thought. And and so, but it's, you know, it's not off the table. It, it just takes some arranging and, and some planning and, and we're still we're still trying to make that happen. Maybe not at that exact location, but we're still pursuing it. <clears throat> There's a lot of land there. There is. Yeah, and yeah. I think it would be a really good place for, so for, um, you know, groups of people to meet and recreate and maybe even performances. I think that was mentioned at some time that there might be some kind of a stage or something. Yeah, we, you know, we we kind of got excited when we heard the first price, which was not the right price. And <laughs> once we dug into it, we. Uh, internally, we kind of really got going, right? And we had all this opportunities and we thought, you know, there's going to be a nice trail segment here and an area for maybe an amphitheater or something of that nature and have these tennis courts and potentially these uh, soccer five courts, we call them, but they're basically a soccer field within a tennis uh, court uh, style complex. 
Uh, but then once we learned the, the price tag of just the land, we had to kind of pull back and say, well, okay, we got to kind of pull back a little bit from this. And, and so we've got great ideas. We've got great people that uh, can generate all these good ideas and we'll, we'll get there at some point. Good. Well, I, I, one of my concerns is just the neighborhood. Yeah. To see, you know, to try to predict what the outcome will be, but I'm not opposed to this. It's just a greater amenity. Yeah, and that's a good point. I will add, and you all were on the, the email from the gentleman that lives just to the north of this. We did have one person that was in opposition to this uh, when we did our notification process. And, you know, I think we addressed his concerns. We haven't heard from him since. Uh, so I don't know if he reached out to any of you. I'm assuming you would have let us know had that happened. Uh, but just to be fair and, and transparent, we did have one resident that was opposed to this project on the very north side of 40th Avenue. And just <clears throat> just to add a little bit on these, you know, as Dave talked about these kind of community parks, um, you know, one of the parks we had some issues with last year was up at Johnson Park, just south of T-Lot. And I think what we're looking at there, we do have the room. It's just maybe more of a redesign of the park and try to locate, you know, maybe some of these soccer five fields and basketball courts away from the homes to the east and push them over to the, the drain to the west. But there's really not a parking lot there. There's just street parking, which kind of interrupts the homes to the east. So I think if we create parking, put like a park buffer on the east side of the park, put the activity closer to that drain, I think that'd be a a uh, good concept out there. And we next week we're also meeting with the the police department. I think it's next week um, to maybe address some of these issues and and meet them head on before they become some issues in the future. I think one of the problems with that Johnson area is similar to Jefferson, although I'm not positive. But Jefferson is really hard to develop into anything because of the fact of the zip, of the drain. Mm -hmm. And there's water in there at certain times, even in the summer when there's a big rain. Plus the ground is uneven. So when people try to play soccer and other games there, they're at an incline, which is pretty much unfair to anyone trying to learn how to play a game well. So I don't know if that exists at Johnson or... It does to a certain extent. On the west side of Johnson Park, it's much the same as Jefferson because it is an active drainage you know, mechanism for the city of Fargo. Uh, there is opportunity though there, I think, uh, as Dave mentioned, to kind of redevelop that park, if you will, and and maybe take, take it away from being a soccer complex and more into a community park where we could add parking on the north side, you know, accentuate that building that we already have there. That playground is on our schedule to update, but we know that, you know, we've been having these talks internally of, well, do we really give this whole area an overhaul? So we've, we've kind of paused on, on that particular playground, but I think there's some really good opportunities there to be had. Thank you. Yep. I think it's good to listen to the citizens too and how it's being used and be ready to shift. Mm -hmm. You know, our city grows all the time and new things pop up all the time. And if we are nimble enough to understand that, we can move forward in a positive way, so. Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. Yep. All right. All right. Do we have a motion? I will uh, move to approve as presented. Second? Second. Do we have a motion and a second? Do we have discussion? There being none, Dave, pull the board. In so he's not in the meeting right now. Commissioner Rosted? Aye. No, I was just kidding. Um, <laughs> Commissioner Deutsch? Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Dawson? Aye. Commissioner Morgan? Aye. Commissioner Griggs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Commissioners. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Number seven. Board to discuss and consider for approval remodel and replacement options for Island Park Pool. Kevin Bow and Dave Clunt presenters. Thank you, Madam President. Commissioners, back uh, in the March Facilities Committee, we presented three options for that pool design. We did have uh, uh, a lengthy discussion and commissioners asked us to bring back to the full board more information with estimated attendance figures, revenue expenses from other facilities. I know Dave Clunt, obviously at the podium, has worked closely with other area organizations to uh, get that information. We've worked with Tony from Zerberg and Doug from WTI that will be here for our uh, budget meeting on the 7th. So they'll be, he'll be able to answer any questions that you have. So 
they came up with the three options with their input. Obviously, we had the staff survey, uh, the, the survey that went out to 2,500 organizations and individuals. Um, Dave working with the aquatics facility and leaders around the community for that. So in those pre, uh, options, as you look at option number one, it was replace the pool, the same current design at the $12.2 million option. Option two is the 50 meter with slide with no lazy river at the $4.3 million option or option three with the 50 meter slides and lazy river at the 15.3. So some of that supporting information, oh, I'd, I'd add to, I know there was conversations with some of the commissioners that about keeping the kind of the same design with a separate diving well. That diving well would add a $1.6 million cost to the construction of that pool. So that's a significant increase as we look at that. So some of the supporting information, uh, um, Island Park pool under the current design, we get 20,000 patrons for the summer. Um, in 2019, we had an income of 115 with the expenses of 230. Uh, Davies uh, at 25,000 patrons for the summer. Um, the Aberdeen facility that we looked at, which is very similar to the option number three, as we look at the 50 meter uh, with slides and lazy river, um, they did $355,000 in revenue with an expenses of $408,000. So uh, a significant increase in revenue. Uh, obviously there's expense to go along with that, but at this point we would uh, answer any questions that you might have. Hold on, wait, real quick, one second. Well, I just, well, I just want to clarify that I didn't, I didn't necessarily understand that the diving well would it would be very similar to what Harry Holland used to be like with it, with the, with it being a, being attached but an yet L separated, shape. right? An L shape. You're yeah. Thinking. Oh. So, so, and ironically, in my homework, I realized that Island Park in its original design, before it was redesigned, actually was that was that design the Harry Holland design for sake of argument so sure. anyway so I, I'm not a, I mean so I I wanted to know what what it would be like to have this separate well but by no means is that sure. uh, necessarily especially at that price tag so sure anyway go ahead Vic sorry no worries so I do want to clarify Aberdeen I'm guessing this is their one water park yes so Dave, all of, had, Dave had those conversations with all uh, of their patrons would go to this one water park. Yeah, they built that pool about 15 years ago and yeah. they actually shut down two pools to merge to that one water okay. park. Because we would obviously still have Davies and South and North. So not everyone in Fargo is going to magically come to this pool. Correct. And we're not going to get 50,000 people just because we built this new pool. So I think we have to be cautious about assuming we're going to get this huge surge in revenue because we built something new yeah we because we're still spreading amongst four pools sure sure we just wanted to show what yep what Aberdeen was doing yeah. since it was very similar to the yep. design option three that we looked at and i appreciate that and obviously they're a different size community than we are too so it all factors in but but i appreciate you looking at other communities too and i i really like the input you went and sought out from other aquatics people to get some perspective because I would never think I just go oh yeah lazy river's fun and it wouldn't occur to me how much work that might be for a lifeguard who says where'd that kid go under that dealy who for lack of a better word of tube um, but then I also like the exercise piece and so I, I appreciate your homework that helps a lot to give us some idea on what do people want and what is it from the employee perspective too and staffing so that's helpful so we, if we the difference we'll just pick one and three just as a compare and contrast so you know what the staffing level would be for one because that's where we're at right now yep, we'd be almost identical to what we're at now yep how would staffing change if we went with option three uh, my guesstimates, we'd need probably an extra seven to eight guards okay. spread out in addition to option one. Mm -hmm. And is it, what's the market like for lifeguards? 
the last couple summers i know it was tough a few years ago it's been challenging every summer we we recruit year round and the lifeguard market is getting younger just with all the other jobs out there but um i believe we've done a pretty good effort of recruiting and training and retaining a lot of those kids mm -hmm. so we'll just boost those efforts okay. if we get option hey, three hey, hey dave this is jerry uh, i don't know what happened my internet connect my teens connection dropped my internet's fine but i'm on the phone um just for the sake of everybody but uh the question i have specifically is when you say seven eight lifeguards are you talking about over the course of the season or there's seven eight additional staff on duty at a given time but i'm not exactly sure what you mean sure good question and uh, uh, yes i'm talking seven eight additional staff on duty at a time just to okay. watch all those specific areas of the pool how would you compare that to option two uh, option two would probably be about halfway point you probably need about four to five additional staff compared to option one so your personal preference my preference at this point with all of our homework is option three um, i think stacy talked about it on one of the previous items um, my my best comparison is our current island park pool is a 1960s 70s design and since the 60s and 70s things like large water slides zero depth areas lazy rivers with the fun components and the fitness components are what have been added to other facilities and it i think it would behoove us not to consider i guess moving into the 2000s 2010s 2020s with a new pool, give us an opportunity to create. Um, in visiting with Doug Whitaker with WTI, one of the things that he mentioned to me several times was if you can create a pool with different options that every time those patrons come to the pool, they get a little different experience. I really think option three gets us to that dynamic. Feedback from the neighborhood? Has anybody heard anything from the downtown neighborhood on preference? Or maybe it hasn't, maybe Barry needs to do a whole article on this. <laughs> <laughs> of course we do. So, Someday off the record. <laughs> we, we've talked. We've Barry, talked I'll talk to you afterwards. Yeah. Jerry's got something. Yeah, we talked Go ahead, about Jerry. this issue in the past, but we've talked about this in the past, I think. But uh, I, I am concerned about you know expanding the feature set at the pool area, how it could possibly change the composition of the the park itself. Let alone, I'm I'm worried about the the lack of parking to accommodate you know a potential destination place as opposed to a neighborhood pool. And that's one thing over, you know, we're going to have another meeting here with our, our audit meeting and our budget meeting on May 7th. And we can we can check with um, the city of Fargo and, and check their parking ordinances and find out if we need to add capacity or if we're good with that. But we can definitely check on that. Well, now this is just me thinking off the top of my head, but the parking lot by Island Park Pool has got to be about the goofiest parking lot you've ever seen. And it has the drive-through kind of thing, and then it has the into the spots that some people don't know which way to go. And I, I'd have to believe that there's more capacity if we use that same footprint and just made it better. I don't know. It just it's the. <laughs> it probably had a purpose at its time, but for some reason, it, I just can't figure out this double back, almost make a U-turn into these angled spaces and then there's a driveway where obviously the idea was to drop people off i think but well, i have a feeling with the if we do that at the same time you guys could it's, we could come up with a better concoction maybe yep. but yeah that's a good point jerry 
people end up in the west parking lot of the YMCA sometimes just because they don't really know where they're supposed to be so they just end up there and I know that can be frustrating for the YMCA so we need to make sure we figure that out no Especially different if we're than our parking increase lot increase the traffic dramatically yeah. no there. different than our parking lot gets right. used for other things as well that's kind of the downtown mentality of well it's right here I'll park here right <laughs> and which is you know a community thing yeah and I think the purpose of you know the agenda item tonight is you know try to update the commissioners with some of the information we figured out you know with a separate diving well um, respond to some of your questions try to get those answers over the next two weeks and and be able to present those to you on that May 7th when we can you know kind of do a walking tour of the site so you can see how things lay out well I I mean I, I'll give my two cents now I love the idea of replacing continuing to have a lap pool I love the idea of continuing to have diving wells whether they're together or separate that's a, another discussion but I think that's such a big focal point of Island Park and what it always has been and and it's the only outdoor lap pool so I think that's important I am curious if you didn't do that what would option three look like if you didn't have the 50 meter pool what would that cost be if you just did the other things if you didn't have I mean a is it it's not the 15 minus 12 I'm guessing it's a different combination of dollars so you're saying without even a 25 meter lap pool yeah so or? what if you just did lazy river water slide zero depth I believe isn't uh, the 50 meter pool Dave about 2.5 ballpark and and if you don't have that now that's just fine but I mean when I look at this I look at okay do I buy the do I buy the snowsuit without the hood or do I pay the extra 20 bucks for the hood and that's what I kind of feel like this is we want the 50 meter I don't know how everybody else feels but you start with the 50 meter well what are you adding on and yeah. how much are you gaining by adding on these things and some of the discussion point I mean I think I've you know kind of brought this point out that you know if there was to me I guess if there was a bigger difference in what each amenity costs you know if it was maybe 8 million 12 million 16 million then that's something to really consider savings I think if you look at the estimates right now and our Mr. Finance guy to my left here always gives me grief but um, between 12 2 and 15 3 to get you know a 50 meter lap pool diving well and baby pool and then get the full boat I think that's a relatively good deal for additional amenities because you already have the bathhouse a lot of the circulatory system and then you know just the interior areas of the park so um, I think it's just the way it's laid out here is presented by the mm -hmm. architects and the study it's it's mm -hmm. for the I'm not going to say a little bit more because million dollars are a lot more but mm -hmm. it's a big bang for your buck but the, exactly so it, it, I want to go back to my you know the parking lot concern but the other the other thing that that I worry about is the best way to probably say that is the serenity of the park I mean when we talked about over on the FMCT side we wrestled and we talked about you know the you know just a little bit of uh, change that needed to be made to accommodate the fire lane and everything and the impact on the park and you, you know I look at all of it park or all of it <laughs> I look at Island Park as as a serene uh quiet area you know we had a, a a new pool with the water park features are we going to inadvertently change the the whole dynamic of of island park and what it is and and you know i i don't have any issues against if a, we have a new pool with a lazy river and the slides i think that's all great i just i'm really struggling with that location being at island park and that that that's the part that I get worried about. I agree with Jerry. I would like to see that more um, park like atmosphere. And the question I was going to ask is if you look at this first image, um, is that the as it is now? Mm -hmm. And then uh, as you, there are two more here, I guess. Anyway, some of them have some green space in them. Some of them have a little bit more openness and not as much busyness. And if you think about like aesthetics or the atmosphere of the place, I don't see it as a really big kids um, 
park, you know, a uh, recreational park. I see it more as extending, and in design, that's what you like to do, extending the atmosphere to whatever surrounds it, just like in your house. If you're designing a house, your outdoor areas reflect the function of uh, what's going on inside. So just a comment, but um, I guess if, if I were to choose one, it would probably be the second, just because I see there's more green space, there are trees. One of the problems with the park as it is now, it just doesn't have enough um, green space on the west side so that it feels like it has, uh, you know, an encompassing feeling to it. Um, so I don't think that people necessarily want to be on display uh, when they're at the pool, but instead maybe want to sit back, for instance, in this, this green space over here, which would probably be the south um, east corner. To me, that's attractive. And, and these layouts that were that were put together are, I guess, what we call placeholders, just ideas, topics. So ideally, between now and you know, May 7th, after that, we could come to some final answers for design. I think anything's up in the air. Uh, in, in visiting with some of the swim team, I know Dave Leaker had some emails from some competitive people that are dead against an east-west setup for a pool. Similar to our tennis courts, east-west is not ideal. Uh, so there's a number of factors, no matter what option we go with, that still can be worked out, massaged, so those type of concerns can be addressed. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I think the walking tour will be beneficial to do in early May. Yeah, I mean, this comes full circle back to our original discussion at our retreat. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it, You, you just you just built Davies not too many years ago. We're not doing another pool anytime soon. So we sent out a survey and said, well, what do you guys want if you want a pool? Well, like Dave just said, you've got a pool from the 60s, 70s. That's the one you're choosing to replace right now. And in an, in an environment um, that everything sort of fits together down there with. And do you want to get into the 2000s? Do you want to get into the 2020? Because if, if you don't put in a lazy river here, when will we ever put in a lazy river um, in, in Fargo? When I say when will we ever, I mean in the next 10 years. So, but at the same time, you know, as Jerry said, when we looked at the FMCT, when we're looking at Broadway Square, we're looking at trying to make sure that it fits appropriately uh, in there and kind of maintains the integrity of, of the downtown. So. You know, I, I, uh, <laughs> I empathize with everybody's perspective because because it is, you know, is it chicken and egg? I don't know what you call it, but regardless, it's it, you know, it's it's tough. You got to got to walk that that fine line to try to get as much as you can, but at the same time not, and you know, um, at the same time not not lose that appeal that we that you have down there of the ambiance of downtown Fargo. So this picture obviously doesn't match the scale of this. So that's one thing I'd like to know is this footprint bigger? No. This fits within this footprint. That is correct. So this is edging up against where we now have the concrete, what I'd call where mommies and daddies sit who aren't allowed inside the fence. Right. So Carolyn, if you can go back to that first so that green space that's well to the right of the current bathhouse yep that's where that uh, new bathhouse would sit where where the hand is now correct okay and then if you look at the that. purple and blue water slide use that as your guide see where it bumps out it looks like it sticks out into the sidewalk area or the edge on number three well, and I think before we get too far into this, like Dave said, these are all placeholders. Yeah. So that nope. we can see yeah. the scale of yeah. the footprint of what we have. So it could be that it could be like one of these layouts or it could be completely yes. different. I was just curious if this fits in the, 
existing footprint or if we have to expand into the park to no. fit all these? That was one of our criteria of, okay. of working with the architect that it fit within the scope of that. Yep. And by the way, uh, Jerry, the serenity of the park, you apparently don't see a lot of kids who are going off those diving boards and doing cannonballs and all the other crazy stuff they do off those diving boards. <laughs> But I do, I do agree there is something special about Island Park that we want to make sure we get with the times and take care of our lappers and our competitive swimmers. But, you know, we need it all. That's the struggle. Barry's bringing donuts and, next. And by the way, Jerry, too, I know some quality uh, employees in the NDUS system that can help you with technology. So I'll give them your referral. Your, you can get in touch with them. <laughs> So let's do the walking tour and well, I think I'll mark it off to the hotel. We, we need to think about what this means. Talk to your people. I talked to somebody today who I thought would be on the option one and they were all in on option three. Wow. So yep. I think talk to the, you know, your people. And when we go on our walking tour on the seventh, start thinking about this. Now we've got information on what it means to the staff, how it looks for programming. You know, it, it is a, it's a, departure to some extent of what we have right now it's going to change the park and we just have to decide which components we're going to put into it so commissioners if you need any other information please reach out to dave or myself and we'll get you that information uh one other thing that we'd have to start to think about is the rfp for the architect services as well as the construction manager for this project to make sure that we keep on task because obviously we want to if, if possible, if it, if it is a go, uh, that we start uh, possibly a demo in the winter. So that's something to consider too. And I think what our plan is, we'll, we'll kind of run the RFP process parallel over this next, you know, two to four weeks so that once the board makes a decision on scope, we're ready to move on architectural services. So as Kevin said, maybe we can do a, you know, as long as we're going to go with it, we can do a split demo pack or we do the whole package, but we do the demo in the fall, so. Okay, just keep the water in the pool this year. And <laughs> it's gonna be good. That is our goal. Thank you for all of the information and. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, it's a great opportunity, exciting. All right, next up. Throw your hat on. Number not, no, number eight. Should we just skip eight and go to nine? No, I'm kidding. They're kind of tied together. Number eight, <laughs> board to discuss and consider for approval of financing options for the capital projects. Brock Leitz. With the conversation we just had about full, it also ties to the conversation we had at the retreat regarding capital projects for this year. Commitment, the financial commitments is for those projects uh, at your March 9th meeting. You did approve two major capital projects with funding limits up to $38.5 million, then up to $16 million, uh, having a total uh, investment from the Park District of 54 Administration has identified to, to date uh, $10.5 million to put to projects and some plans that we've made. That would leave us with a total as we discuss this at I can't hear Brock. Mike, not on. Uh, Hello. No, I don't sound like. Must be unplugged somehow, but it's a little better. But all right, how's that, Jerry? Oh, perfect, perfect. Ah, there we go. So uh, at the retreat, you had talked to uh, us about uh, finding uh, funding options as well as any additional resources we might have um, to make these capital projects uh, happen. In that regard, uh, I have visited with two separate financial advisors to get proposals 
for um, what it would look like if we bonded for these projects and uh, what we would need the uh, commission to do at this point is um, approve the recommendation that we have for working with uh, PFM, who is a uh, financial advisor in issuing the general obligation bonds. And also uh, we would move forward with the, the next agenda item about uh, the bond resolution. We'll get to that uh, in a moment. What we would recommend to you uh, at this point is that you do approve PFM as our financial advisor and also um, um, moving forward with a uh, general obligation bonding uh, uh, opportunity here to fund these capital projects. Um, briefly, I can walk through, uh, we've identified $44 million as the need. Um, you see kind of how that breaks down uh, in the proposal that we got. And, and it's a little confusing because the initial par value of that bond is $41.5 million. And then you see a net premium. What happens is in the, in the current environment in Fargo, um, and with everything that's happening with bond rates, uh, as well as with valuation, et cetera, um, we're in a market where uh, agencies will actually pay you a premium. So they will um, pay more to get these bonds because then they, they can, what they're earning on them compared to what they're getting in the market, that's really what makes up that, that premium. So when you look at it and we say 44 million, you gotta get into the math to find that 44 million. Um, and that's because of the breakdown of, of what that premium is. And then you've got costs associated with that. The, the best way I could describe that for you, because this is a new process for the park district is uh, many of us who bought homes, you, you have costs for appraisals and attorney's fees and those types of things. And all those are built into those cost of issuance um, that would net out uh, where we would be with this. So um, at, at this point, I guess we'd be looking for approval for uh, working with PFM and financing these projects as we've laid out here. And I can certainly answer any questions you might have in that regard. Any reason PFM over AMCO? Yeah, so um, both PFM and AMCO have done business with the Park District uh, in the past. And when we uh, took a look at the opportunities here, um, it really comes down to um, the attention to detail, the level of service, the uh, the work they've done uh, to get to today in, in really providing information and being available to answer questions and things of that nature. You know, the reality is so much of this comes down to, to service. Pricing is the same in a lot of cases because a lot of your costs of issuance are the same regardless of who you use. Um, so it really comes down to, um, you, you know, feeling comfortable with the level of expertise and the service that we're getting provided. And uh, as we went through the process of, of getting proposals from them and, and conversations conversations we've had, uh, both myself and, and Luke, who uh, was involved in this with me, just felt um, a, a different comfort level with PFM and the magnitude of, of this type of offering uh, in this case. The, the other thing I should mention is um, as we look at this $44 million in bonds, uh, we will continue to look for opportunities uh, with our current resources. We're, we're continuing uh, to do work with other public entities in, in looking to try to reduce that. So the reality is uh, this is a worst case scenario from a debt in indebtedness uh, process for the park district. Um, we'll do everything we can between now and when you actually sell the bonds um, to try to reduce possibly what would happen with that. That also includes uh, scope of projects and pricing. Um, if, if the Island Park Pool project comes in lower, if the, um, if the sports complex project comes in lower, you, you may not have to issue that level of debt. This is a worst case scenario maximum you would possibly issue. So basically what this uh, table is showing us, Brock, is that the, the loan for $44 million, there's about $468,000 in costs associated with generating that, that loan, essentially. Is that right? Or 
Yes, uh, commissioners and Jerry, that is exactly right. And, and understand that those are point in time estimates by PFM and the reality is, um, you know, you may see those prices be less than that uh, because it'll all depend on, you know, included in those costs are things like uh, our bond council putting together the resolutions and things of that nature. So depending on the amount of time they've got invested in those, those costs could go down and PFM, uh, as I've worked with them in the past, has been very good at um, having their estimates uh, at a level where um, we, we likely would see less cost than that. Uh, there shouldn't be any surprises, um, but yes, the 468, 913 would be the cost of the issuance and, and those could improve as we get closer to the sale date. So that's about a 1% fee, is that about right? Or is that for this kind of money or? Um, commissioners and Jerry, it's it's really not the fee. There's a flat uh, cost to the issuance to PFM. These are really um, the costs of the underwriting, the cost of attorney's fees, uh, the cost of we'll have to do a bond rating call. Uh, in so all of those costs are figured in there. So yeah, I mean, if you if you look at it as as total cost of issuance, but I don't want that to get confused with the fee to the advisor because that is different. It's coincidental that it's about 1%. Yep. Is Correct. that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any more questions for Brock on this subject? Uh, I had a conversation with Paul Schultz. Is that you? Yes. Yeah. Last night. Uh, and uh, he was concerned about the issuance of the bonds and the responsibility of the public um, for the taxation that goes with it and whether they had been consulted um, uh, about the project. Do you want to say something about that? Well, my concern is being fairly new and getting reacquainted with Fargo because we were, we raised our kids here and then once they were out of college and the dog died, did a career change and we were gone for about 20 years, moved back about four years ago. And then uh, just been kind of always been involved in the community in the past to see some of these things happening and uh, listening in on a couple of meetings. How, uh, you know, you're looking at financing two projects. So do you go to the public for this financing? Um, thank you, Commissioners and Paul. Uh, we're actually segueing into the next agenda item, but I can certainly address that uh, as well, and, and we can discuss it when we get to agenda item nine if there's additional questions. So um, the legislature in 2019 changed the rule that allows general obligation bond issuance from a park district, and they can do it by action of the board. And so what will happen with uh, if the commission approves the next agenda item is there will be what's called a 60 day protest period where this ac action and the desired issue debt will be put out in the legal notices for public consumption. And for a period of 60 days, the public can um, provide feedback input. Um, there's a formal protest process that the public can participate in uh, to uh, make sure that, that they are either heard or formally protest uh, the issuance of these bonds. And it's not until after that 60 days that the board will actually issue or make a decision of whether they will or will not issue the debt. And so in this particular case, uh, there is not a requirement to go out and do a referendum and get a, a, a voter approval for the issuance of, of that debt. But there is a requirement for us to put out a 60 day protest period to gather public feedback and public input and, and give the public their opportunity to discuss with administration or their elected officials um, any questions or concerns they have about this process. And, and then it's the responsibility of those elected officials and the staff that they hire to take that 
that into account before making a final decision. So that's the formal process, and we're going to talk about that uh, in just a moment. Um, in regards to the servicing of the debt, certainly uh, not news, so whether it's through um, uh, general fund levies, whether it's through sinking and interest levies, or whether it's uh, special assessment levies, which is how the Park District has typically financed projects. If you're taking on debt, you need a repayment source, and, and in public projects, those repayment sources typically are property taxes. And so one of the, the conversations that and the decisions that the Commission will have to make is when we get to a final issuance of debt, what level of property tax will it take to service that debt and and we will know that once we get to the issuance of the final number if it's 44 million if it's 42 40 whatever that number is based on the, how much debt they issue then we will uh, take a look at the value of a single mill and determine how many we how many mills we would need to service that debt and and certainly um, that is the common repayment source of public debt Uh, that amount would be known um, before the pro during the protest period, I guess I would say. So, you know, once the board approves uh, how much debt they would issue, we certainly would be working uh, with PFM and getting estimates on how many mills would it take to service uh, that debt. So, the public will be aware of that information during that process. Uh, so the the bond resolution, if approved tonight, will be advertised uh, in the legal section of the Fargo Forum, which is the uh, media uh, outlet of choice for these particular pieces. Um, and then any additional information as it pertains to uh, final level of debt or or how much it what it will take to service that debt. Um, will be communicated appropriately through our marketing department, through the commission. We'll determine um, when they're making decisions and information they need, uh, how they communicate that out will be directed by both the board and our marketing department. No, I'm just look, looking around, seeing if there's additional questions. <laughs> It's in Typically Wednesday's in, paper, yeah, and Wednesday. it is the actual paper. Right. Yep, yeah. correct. Uh, so, you know, if they, the board approves it, they get a lot of kickback, then they can gauge their approval later on? Uh, right, so commissioners and Paul, when we get to the next agenda item, if the board approves the bond resolution, which initiates the 60 day protest period, that obligates the, the commission or the park district to absolutely nothing. It simply is an opportunity for the community to give input. A final decision on whether or not they, we issue debt and how much debt will be made after that 60 day protest period and after a, a notice of sale of bonds. Um, that's when the final decision will be made. The action tonight just opens the door for the public input on these projects and the potential funding of these projects. People are gonna ask how much, you know, I think there have been some numbers in terms of property taxes and I don't, I wouldn't think that, that those numbers are available currently I've heard a few, but uh, um, you know that when there's the protest period that opens that people are going to, that's going to be the first question. Is there any way to address that before the protest period? Yeah, I, I can address that from an estimated standpoint today because what, what you need to understand is um, the mill levy won't be certified until the new budget cycle and then uh, it would be in effect for the for next year and we won't have um, the estimated valuation increase from the city assessor's office until later this month and so everything we have to date is an estimate based on uh, historical information and current uh, mill levy structure so what i can tell you is what we know today based on value 
total taxable valuation and the value of one mill right now is that it would take approximately 4.2 mills to service the $42 million in debt. Um, that information is based on conservative estimates of valuation growth because of what's happened uh, in the past year with the pandemic and what's happened with growth. The growth was slower than it's been in the past 10 years uh, in this in the city of Fargo. So we will firm uh, we'll, we'll firm up those numbers with the city. Typically, the assessor's uh, annual report comes out in mid to late April. So once we have that, we will run new numbers with PFM on what the valuation is that the city has determined, and that will give us a better understanding of what it would take to service the 44 million in debt. The other reason that's an estimate is we may not issue $44 million in debt. You may issue 42 or 40 or some number less than, than 44 million. And so the danger with anticipating what might that mill levy be today is that there's too many unknowns. You don't know how much debt you'll issue. You don't know what the estimate is on valuation increase. We will know those uh, one of those two items within the next two weeks. Um, and then we can put out, uh, I think, an information sheet on now that we have new valuation, um, we can estimate worst case scenario on $44 million. Um, so that's what we know today uh, as far as what it would take to service that debt. Um, when you get into conversations of mill levies, it, it is confusing at times. And, and what does that mean? And, and uh, in the simplest terms, Terms, um, one mill basically adds four dollars and fifty cents um, to property tax values for every one hundred thousand dollars of valuation that you have. So, if you have a hundred thousand dollar house and there's a one mill increase, it's four dollars and fifty cents is the increase. Mm -hmm. If you have a two hundred thousand dollar house and it's a one mill increase, it's nine dollars annually as the increase. So that's a, a way to understand the general impact it would have. If you understand the value of your house, you understand what the mill levy increase might be, and then you can just do the math at four dollars and fifty cents per hundred thousand per mill. Thank you. Any more questions? Comments? Uh, I didn't know that we could comment at this time. Oh, yes. Uh, the only other one that I would venture a comment on is when you were talking about the pool. And Thor made a comment about doing cannonballs at Island Park. And I got kicked out of that pool many times. <laughs> <laughs> You're first, you're first in the new pool day, right. Paul. We know who's breaking yeah. it in. Yeah. That was the one, the, first, the original one that I was referring to before it got the separate thing, yeah. Hawthorne. Hawthorne. And there's a whole lot in the south of the town road from London. You got that whole big area where the low pitch really used to, when I was proud to be part of the one before that started this whole pitch really here in Park Road. I looked at Johnson's picture up there. He worked with us on that and it went from about 60 teams in three years. Uh, but you got that whole big open area there. The population for kids is much more in that area. And if you're going to do 
sometimes maybe it's a need and have the facility parking space uh, you get a whole bunch of property and uh, trying to sell something at the island park maybe you have seen this better day yeah and i maybe just a, just a quick thing that I picked up from that. I, I think Linwood is a great park, and I think in most instances that would be a great location. It's um, and Dave, help me if I'm wrong, but you know that park still will flood at a certain elevation, and it's inside that levee that protects the homes down there. So um, I think if you no, but but it's within the 500-year floodplain, and I think we'd have difficult time in trying to get a permit to build a new structure within that footprint. I mean, I think it's a great idea. It's a regional park. It's whatever, but it, it's just not conducive to put a new structure there. So, but it's a good idea. It's a great park. You sure like to muddy the water, don't you, Paul? <laughs> you like to muddy the water. I'm gonna keep. I'm keeping my eye on you. I'm gonna keep my eye on you. Well, th this was great conversation, and we've been talking about it for a long time. And you know, today we're looking at the top end of what we potentially may need for funding to cover these two major projects. And there's a process. And thank you, Brad, for outlining in detail the process that we need to go through. Um, so, worst case scenario today, we have to borrow all of it, incur debt, and it means. You know, again, worst case scenario with the limited information we have today, 4.2 mil increase, just something to consider. But w the other thing we have to remember is we continue to be, um, Brian and Craig continue to be out working, looking for outside funding from corporate sponsors to philanthropists wanting to build up Fargo. And, and um, that number will ultimately change what the end number is and the other thing is we're looking within as well we're looking at right. how we process and how we operate and where can we look for savings and efficiencies and different things so you know i hate that the numbers are the numbers but i don't want them to be the lead story because they right. it, it, we just started and madam president members of uh, the board uh, to build on that i think the big picture we have to think about is the estimated cost of these two projects is 77 million dollars for the sports complex and 16 million dollars for island park pool so 93 million dollars in capital projects and <clears throat> you're considering committing 54 and a half million dollars to 93 million dollars of projects so for every dollar spent on these major amenities for fargo in the region you're putting in 58 cents of that and so it's important to know that you're going to have a a lifelong opportunity and project of these of, of this nature serving both the community and the region um, for under 60% total cost of the value of these two projects. So I think that's the big picture approach to think about as well. The other thing to remember is we have a, some mills dropping off from capital projects of the past. So it, you know, it's a, it's an ongoing story. Correct. So, all right. Is there more discussion on number eight? I, I just want to clarify something for in my thoughts and my, um, on this $44 million is right now we have it separated with the sports complex at 38 and a half million and Island Park pool at 16 million. And I just wanna make sure one project doesn't compromise the other project. So if at the end of the day, we determine we want a lesser Island Park or we wanna lessen the sports complex, I don't wanna do it on the back of the other projects. So I don't wanna say, well, if we skimp at Island Park, we can spend more money on the sports complex or vice versa. So in my mind, the 44 million would be for the 16 million towards Island Park pool. And if we spend less on Island Park pool, we don't get to shove that money over towards the sports complex and vice versa. So just wanna put that out there for my brain. And then the scope of the project for the sports complex, the plan with this 38 and a half million dollars, which is 50% of the project, is for turf courts walking and ice and i just want to make sure that that still stays as that is our plan that's our intention and our goal is to have all of those pieces as part of the project okay uh, do we have a motion uh. 
Uh, I'll move to adopt the initial resolution for the issuance of general obligation. Oh, nope, sorry. Let's go back one. That's the next one. That's Ooh, the next my bad. Okay. <laughs> we kind of it's right behind you on the screen. Together. Oh, it's their back to back pages. That's my problem. Eight. All right. I'll make a motion to approve the capital projects and financing options as presented. Well, that was simple enough. I could have done that without reading. <laughs> I'll second. Uh, we have a second. Dan. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there a discussion? Hearing none, Dave, pull the board. Commissioner Rosted? Yes. Commissioner Deutsch? Aye. Commissioner Dawson? Aye. Commissioner Morgan? Aye. Commissioner Griggs? Aye. Motion carries. And now agenda number nine. Is there more? Do you want to add more to how this resolution works or? Uh, Madam President, uh, Commissioners, just very briefly, uh, this is the formal process for approving the initial resolution for the issuance of general obligation bonds. This is your legal requirement to notice the public and start the 60 day probation uh, protest period. Uh, there is a, uh, a form that we will need uh, the president to sign as well as the clerk when we're finished here. And then our uh, bond council will have this uh, placed in the paper tomorrow and your official clock will start ticking uh, on Thursday Thursday the 15th. So the 60 days will start effective uh, basically midnight of the 15th, 1201, and then your 60 day time period and we'll bring it back to you once that protest period is done. So that is um, the formality of this issuance. We can get this in tomorrow morning's paper newspaper? Correct. I know a guy. Barry, Barry you going to put some <laughs> strings for us here? <laughs> 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 All right, uh, unless anybody else has something else to say, I've already practiced this once, so I'll do it again. Uh, I'll move to adopt the initial uh, resolution for the issuance of general obligation park facilities bonds series 2021A. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? Hearing none, Dave, hold the board. Commissioner Rosted. Yes. Commissioner Deutsch? Aye. Commissioner Dawson? Aye. Commissioner Morgan? Aye. Commissioner Griggs? Aye. Motion carries. I, I would like to suggest whoever named it a protest period, they got to come up with something nicer. Concerns, comments, suggestions. I, I disagree. It's a protest. Call your local well, legislator. Someone is, I mean, we're not going to hear from people who are all in. That's true. We're going to hear from people who are concerned that we're making a bad choice. Protesting. Uh, I'm, with, I'm with Vicki. A, a comment, a questions, comments, or concerns. I'm not protesting if I want to know some more information. Like he wasn't necessarily protesting when he came in and asked questions today. Well, the idea I think is a legal term, isn't right. it? And so it's not for us or somebody sure. to decide. It's, it's right. All right. <laughs> we're just having That's fun. That's why I waited until yeah. we were all done yeah. to no, I'm just, Put it in there. yeah, it's out of our control what it's referred you know, to, I, but I'm saying, tonight. fine. <laughs> I'm with Vicki, let's keep it positive. Fine. Cannonball. I'll move to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>